This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Shinise Omara, finding out how a cheap and simple solution is helping buildings in Nepal to become more earthquake resilient. And I'm Frankie McCamley in London to find out how vertical farming could mean more sustainable food production. On the 25th of April, 2015, Nepal was hit by an earthquake measuring 7.8 on the Richter scale. The earthquake devastated rural villages and flattened whole neighborhoods in Kathmandu. Temples and monuments that stood for centuries collapsed. 9,000 people died, and around 2.8 million people lost their homes. Earthquakes don't kill, buildings do. Earthquakes do not happen every day to educate us, which means that if you don't have previous experience, you think that, okay, because a building is standing, it's gonna withstand an earthquake as well, but that's not true. When was this uh, school constructed? Ten years, ten years ago. Ten years. But according to local methods, we don't yes, yes. No seismic codes. Oh, yes. This is important. Because seismic code is important. In, in low-income countries, typically people build as they can. And then all of a sudden a large earthquake happens and it's, it has devastating effects. Professor Anastasios Sextos and his team at Bristol University are part of the Safer Nepal project, which works with local communities to ensure that the devastation caused by the 2015 earthquake never happens again. They use their expertise in seismic engineering to make not just new, but also existing structures more safe. Yeah, small down because what is important is the beat and the color. In developing countries, typically the quality of the materials is low. People, you know, they just have to cope with their life. They don't follow seismic codes. They don't, they, they can't. They can't afford, or they, there is no framework to do so. Seismic codes are a set of criteria needed to calculate and design structures so they remain stable during an earthquake. Where they've not been followed, Professor Sextos is able to advise communities whether their buildings are safe to use. Yeah, but the main elements like those columns yes. are reasonably yeah, 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 Kids spend an enormous amount of time uh, in these buildings. It's almost half of the day. And this is, I think, the number one priority to be um, resilient. As well as assessing for post-quake stability, the team work with local experts to test the value of retrofitting buildings to prepare for future earthquakes. We set up a large um, campaign of experiments in Nepal with the Institute of uh, Structural Engineering and um, National Technology to make sure that we have good understanding about the properties of the materials that are used in Nepal. It doesn't really take a very heavy intervention to prevent collapse of a building. Professor Sextos's colleague, Dr. Nicholas Alexander, is assisting with the experiments. It's very important when we construct a wall that we construct it using local materials and local artisanship. So this can't really be done effectively in the UK. They have to be done in situ in Nepal. The key research question is how much variability is there in the capacity of this wall? 
So we don't necessarily build structures that are perfect. Probably this would make a very boring experiment. We know it's gonna resist the earthquake. We are trying to reproduce the local vulnerabilities that we observe around the world and then test them, see them fail, and then test them again with a retrofit solution and see how effective uh, this is. From their findings, an app was designed to help engineers in Nepal identify weak spots and implement retrofitting solutions to help increase earthquake resilience. The Safer Nepal project also wants to build resilience into new structures. This means understanding vulnerabilities of local buildings and construction methods. There seems to be a lot of stone used to construct these Nepalese buildings. So it's quite common in the rural, rural regions um, of Nepal to use uh, stone masonry. We have to realize that masonry in any type, it's not that much about the stone or the bricks, it's mainly about the mortar. There is a need for workmanship, the corners to be tied properly, and you need somehow to have a diaphragm action so that the, the walls won't fall out of plane and the roof is gonna fall on, on top of the residents or the students. Back in the UK, the seismic engineers are able to lay their hands on some state-of-the-art equipment to really stress test the Nepalese building techniques. Let us try to create a controlled platform that we can shake mechanically to reproduce the movement of the ground in case of an earthquake. So these are the accelerometers measuring the accelerations in Z and Y direction, and these are the displacement markers over here that actually are tracked by five cameras and measure the displacement of the specimen in X, Y and Z direction. Bristol University's shake table is one of only a few in the world and has allowed Professor Sextos to develop new technology that he hopes will make a difference in Nepal. All over the world during the last 20 years there has been um, some effort to try to separate the building from the ground that is moving. And that is made in, uh, let's say, in higher income countries through a technology that is called seismic isolation with devices that are smart, uh, lead rubber bearings or sliding bearings and other quite expensive equipment. Building with this sort of design a world renowned for being earthquake proof, but the technology and construction methods are really expensive. Was it possible to find a cost-effective way to achieve the same result? So we thought that probably we can decouple the structure from the ground in a natural way. So the idea is, can we try to lay something in between the foundation and the ground so that when the earthquake becomes stronger, then there is this fuse of sliding, it starts sliding. So the ground is moving, but the structure remains intact. We used um, soil that was mixed with chopped rubbers that nobody needs, and we tried to see if this mixture would perform well. It performed quite well, but it, because it's soft, it was tilting a little bit. So we said, let us, let us improve it somehow. And this is why exper large-scale experiments are needed. After a number of trials, a workable solution was found. This is a low-cost technique that involves uh, kind of a sandwich, as we aim to call it, two PPC layers and in between, a quantity of sand, so it's like little bubbles on which the building can slide in a controlled way beyond the magnitude of an earthquake. The design begins by creating a solid levelled base. On top of this, the isolation system is created, consisting of a thin layer of sand sandwiched between two layers of PVC. A concrete slab is cast onto the upper PVC layer on which the masonry building is constructed. When an earthquake occurs, the sandwich layer effectively decouples the structure from the shaking ground, activating a sliding behaviour that keeps the building intact. The solution sounds fantastic, but will people in Nepal be able to incorporate it into their building practices? The, the challenge, of course, when we suggest such solutions is to produce something that is not only meaningful scientifically and low cost, 
it has to be technically feasible, culturally acceptable, locally resourced. So to design a resilient system, you have to effectively co-produce it with a local community. You cannot just jump from Mars and try to implement a solution that you have developed in the lab. One new school with this design is currently in the pipeline and Professor Sextos is optimistic that it will be taken up locally in Nepal. The technology to build resilient schools overall is now settled. It is something that we know how we can build structures that can withstand the earthquakes as we expect them probabilistically. The problem is, do we have the money to build structures like that? Because this is, I think, the missed link in the chain of seismic safety implementation. On paper, everything is perfect. The engineering solution is there to protect lives. Implementation is the key. By 2040, it's likely that over half of all new cars will be electric. Already over 2 million electric vehicles are sold each year and rising. One problem with today's electric vehicles is that they use several different systems to charge. If you set off on a trip without compatible charging stations along your route, you could find yourself stranded. So-called range anxiety is a major barrier to electric car adoption. The race is on to produce batteries with ever longer ranges. But there's something on the horizon that could be a game changer for electric cars. Wireless charging. Based on a process called magnetic induction, an alternating current flows through a metal coil in a pad on the ground, creating a magnetic field. This generates current in a second coil on the vehicle, which is converted to direct current to recharge the battery. Power can be transferred over longer distances by setting the receiver and transmitter coils to resonate at the same frequency. It operates at 90 to 93% efficiency. That's comparable to plugging in. While a number of companies are innovating in this area, universal standards are being introduced for wireless charging, with the aim that one day the same system could work for all electric cars. Some car models are already available with cable-free charging, and the technology could be on a street near you by 2022. One development promising even more convenience is dynamic electric vehicle charging, topping up your battery on the go. In future, highways could include lanes with a series of coils embedded a few centimeters below the surface, which transmit energy to the vehicle's receiver. The system would calculate how much electricity each driver had used and build them accordingly. With early trials showing promising results, it's a technology that could banish range anxiety for good. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. 
from our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter, showing you a different perspective. See the difference. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. century, industrial farming practices and the globalisation of our food supply have caused great damage to environmental systems and contributed to the climate crisis. As the impacts of soil degradation and water scarcity increase, so does the impact on the quality of our food. So how do we feed a growing population safely and sustainably? I'm here in London to find out if urban vertical farming is part of the answer. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Frankie. Nice to meet you. Hi, am I in the right place? It doesn't feel like you've got a farm growing here. Yes, we've got two to show you today. Jamie and his team at Vertical Future have been running a traditional vertical farm for the past three and a half years, growing fresh produce for local restaurants. It's not often you head upstairs to a farm, is it? No. Wow. It's a Im big impact on your eyes, isn't it? Yes, exactly, yeah. It seems like um, you're almost in like another world or a spaceship or something. This is about 70% red and 30% blue in terms of the lighting and is a, a good mix for these type of plants. So we've got watercress, sage, Greek cress, different wasabi. types of basil, this is wasabi mustard. <laughs> You've got this all year round, it's the same temperature. Can you just grow whatever you want? To a degree. I mean, there are limits on what these systems can grow. We're never going to grow coconuts and bananas <laughs> or anything in, in a vertical farm, but in general, you can grow a decent amount of baby leaf crops, all yeah. your different types of herbs, and obviously full head uh, lettuce as well. Obviously, it looks completely different to other types of farming, but how does it actually differ growing crops here than it does to growing them in the outside world? By moving crops indoors, you're effectively allowing a, a higher degree of control over the growing environment. So generally, we see um, much higher yields. We're much closer to end consumers, so we have a reduction in food miles. And um, this is a, a standard hydroponic system. So one of the good things about not using soil and having a system like this, which is relatively contained, is that we don't have to use any pesticides or herbicides or fungicides. The idea is for this to be a much more sustainable approach. But then you look around and we're actually in a warm area. We're in a building. There's lots of lighting going on. Is it really more sustainable? We're using pretty much off-the-shelf technologies for this particular farm. The farm that we're going to show you afterwards, which is our own technology, we very much focused on seeking improvements in every single area and designing a system which confronts all those issues. Jamie and his team have redesigned many elements of these vertical farming systems with the plan to sell their hardware and software to future farmers across the world. Oh, wow. What's happening up there? 
A major part of their new system is that it's fully automated from seeding to harvest. <laughs> it does look funny, doesn't it? Just crest on the move. So we came up with a, a float system in these canals where products are continually moving through the system. These are also aeroponic and uh, hydroponic systems. And then outside of this main growing process, we've automated pretty much every component. So we've got robots on each side where energy is required to obviously move crops. And then we've got this almost like roller coaster type system here for uh, effectively sorting out crops, harvesting, uh, and cleaning. The aeroponic system works by spraying the roots with a fine mist containing a recipe of nutrients that normally would be found in soil. This means the plants can focus their energy on growing upwards rather than down. Jen, who's our head of plant R&D, will talk to you about the reason why we've got different colours. With the industry still in its infancy, the race is on to find the optimum practice. What on earth is going on here, Jen? <laughs> OK, so this is our new system, and this is an R&D trial that we're running on it. So these plants are growing under the equivalent of daylight. The daylight, is that because these plants are best suited to daylight? So basically, plants evolved under a daylight situation. So, you know, you've got to start at where their baseline is, and they've, they've baselined all of their development processes on daylight. And so if you're starting to think about, OK, which elements of the light are they using and which aren't they using, the best thing to then do is start stripping it out. Plants do a process called photosynthesis, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. And that's the process by which they use light energy to build sugars and grow bigger. But what plants also do is a process called photomorphogenesis, and that involves different light receptors. So plant cells are full of different receptors for light. So they have things like phytochromes and cryptochromes, and these all respond to different wavelengths of light. Photomorphogenesis is the regulatory effect of light on the growth and development of plants. Plants use photoreceptors to sense different wavelengths for environmental cues such as the day-night transition and light quality to adapt their growth. Phytochromes are the receptors that respond to red light and cryptochromes respond to blue light. These have a variety of functions, including regulating seed germination, plant height, leaf number, size and shape, as well as determining when the plant will flower. So that's why we're cutting out different wavelengths, is because we want to see how the plant responds. And it might be that it responds and it grows faster, or we get a different shape of leaf, maybe. Um, but actually, I think what we're also likely to see are things where the plant will produce a different biochemistry, so it'll taste different, and have different sensorial properties. And that's really important if you're looking to produce, you know, really sort of taste differentiated crops. So in a way, is this genetically modified? No, not at all. So this is working with the genetics that the plant has, but what we're doing is we're activating certain parts of the genome to do things under conditions when maybe they wouldn't normally do it. It's well known that plants use red and blue light for photosynthesis and that generally they reflect green light. And that's why down here, the plants almost look black. It's because they're using and they're taking all that red and blue light in. And up here, um, they are reflecting a lot of that green light. Um, but there's a lot of data that's coming to light that shows that plants don't just reflect all of the green light. They do use some of it. And the exposure to green light can actually give yield gains. So these sort of like traditional pink farms, you know, they're photosynthetically efficient, but are they truly efficient for plant development? And that's the sort of questions that we're looking to ask here. These artificial lighting setups also allow these farmers to remove all seasonality from the growing process, replicating lighting temperatures for different seasons to produce many more harvests all year round. These aren't getting any light at the moment. No, so this is nighttime on the shelf. So 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark, and that allows us to open out the shelves. The concept of vertical farming has been around for decades, but only in recent years have the advances in LED lighting allowed for the production of certain premium crops to become a commercially viable business model. We've got some mustard, we've got some broccoli here. And you say that's broccoli, that doesn't look like the kind of broccoli that I eat. <laughs> so a typical broccoli, like the broccoli you'd be used to, you know, there's a big head. Um, they've been grown for months. 
But this is a microgreen, so you can see the first two leaves have come out. So these are the seed leaves called the cotyledons. And once this has one or two, what we would term true leaves, that would then be a microgreen. So between germination and uh, harvest, we're looking at really no more than two, two weeks for a typical microgreen. They're really tasty and they, they do have, particularly broccoli packs, an incredibly nutritious punch. So this is a basil microgreen. And why would someone want that over, say, the basil plant that you would buy in a general supermarket? The flavour is just so much more intense. Try some if you like. That's the strongest basil. And see, that's the beauty of the, the controlled conditions. Oh my God, that is so strong. It's so strong. It makes mm. the most amazing pesto. Oh, does it? Yeah. Do you often... Um... I might take some home every so often. <laughs> So we're able to also sort of, you know, make play tunes with the nutrients as well as playing tunes with the light. So we do get a much more nutritious, better tasting crop out of it. And that tastes very much like pea, but very strong pea. Oh, wow. The taste test is done and I approve. <laughs> Due to energy economics, these practices have been restricted to the farming of leafy greens, herbs and microgreens. But soon, we expect to see farms transition to the next phase of root vegetables and ground fruits, which require approximately two and a half times more energy to grow. How do you think this is all going to fit into the future of farming? So it's not going to replace traditional crop farming, like what would be called broad acre farming isn't going anywhere because there's crops like wheat and barley, which are just too big to grow in systems like this. But these systems do really well in producing salad crops. And a lot of the salad is actually imported. So to reduce reliance on imports, to reduce food miles, you can localize production. Um, it also allows you to be uh, produced year round and not have to worry about the seasons. And so it allows you to become much more sort of, as a nation, self-sufficient. You want to sell on this technology. How much interest have you had? I think most of our interest is coming from those parts of the world that are getting hit hardest by things like climate change and where there's a very high propensity to, to import goods. So for example, the Middle East, a lot of the countries there are 90% plus imports. I think for them, it's really about stability in the supply chain and overall food security. And I think COVID has highlighted the fragility of global food systems. So if we can farm crops closer to customers in a much more sustainable way that's cost effective, why shouldn't we? We do have a growing population. How do you see us feeding all of those people safely and sustainably? First of all, I think that one of the key aspects that uh, vertical farming addresses is not really about the volume of food, it's about the quality of food and the distribution of food. So at present, for example, we waste a lot of the food that we produce because it's shipped from across the world or it's covered in nasties or we have different requirements in terms of the aesthetics. What vertical farming can do is allow you to effectively bring production much closer to the point of consumption, waste less, and increase quality and also reduce the use of things like pesticides and other nasties that would be associated with outdoor farming. The important thing is that this doesn't remain as some kind of a premium play just for inner city areas and for middle class people who want to, you know, sprinkle products on their food or go to a Michelin star restaurant. This sector needs to become mature. Vertical farming has seen significant growth over recent years, from industry frontrunners Aero Farms in New Jersey to Emirates Airlines, now funding the world's largest vertical farm in Dubai, set to harvest three tonnes of produce every day. Alongside these super farms, Jamie hopes his modular, scalable systems and knowledge sharing approach will bring business opportunities and fresh local food to the most unlikely of regions. It's one of many things that we should be doing as a society, as a human race, to deal with a lot of the issues around climate change and population growth. Agricultural land's getting pressured, and if you can work ways to intensify agriculture without adding additional pressure to agricultural land, then this is the perfect way of doing it. <laughs>